thank two important American friends, our hosts, Dr. Bruce and Bela Waldholz. Hey, thank you, Maggie. It's truly an honor to be here today with our great researchers to really understand the role that Hebrew University has in the scientific community and really on the world stage in terms of discovery and patient care in science. And if I could really share two, two perspectives that have had the opportunity to really see with Hebrew University with the, with the help of the AFU team in some areas that we were interested really in um, medicine and, and science. And a few years ago, we had the chance to meet some medical students at Hebrew University who are part of Samaret, which means treetop in his, Israel, in Hebrew, the very top of the forest. And these students are a special group. They are rigorous selection process involving academics. And unlike other scientific um, endeavors, they are tested for physical fitness, strength, and endurance, and then undergo psychologic testing by the Defense Ministry and the IDF to see if they have what it takes to be combat doctors. And these students really sort of view it as sort of the U.S. Navy SEALs meets Harvard Medical School type of students. They were here in the United States to participate in shock trauma at the University of Maryland and also the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. And their program includes two things that really benefit all of us and hopefully our children and our grandchildren. They study mass casualties. And it's not a question of if it will happen in the Middle East, but when it will happen and how to handle large volumes of patients unexpectedly with a surge. And also they study bioterrorism, among other things, to have implications for all of us in the years ahead. Having had the chance to go to Jerusalem, Maggie and, and the team were kind enough to introduce us to a few scientists. And we had breakfast one day. They said, what are you interested in? I said, well, maybe about cancer. And I had the chance to sit down with a researcher named Dr. Yaval Dor. And as he started to speak and I was taking notes, I thought back very quickly to about 35 years ago where a Jewish researcher at Johns Hopkins named Bert Vogelstein gave a talk to six of us talking about the future of science, and he thought that cancer was a genetic disease and talked about genetic markers, and that someday, maybe for a terrible disease, say like pancreatic cancer, maybe we have an early stage that we could detect it for. And I thought, geez, that would really be amazing. And as Yuval Dor was speaking, I realized the future was here now, right there at the table, the research that he was talking about. And I asked, I just said, naively, I said, well, have you been funded for this? And he said, yes, we've received a little bit from Alzheimer's, a little bit from the government, and also from the NIH. And just so folks know, to receive an NIH grant, about, only about 10% of the R1 grants are approved. It's very, very difficult to qualify for one of those. And I certainly had no idea that foreign scientists would qualify. So I just asked, well, you know, could I ask you what level of funding you receive? And he said, oh, about a million. And he said, a million shekels, thinking, you know, divided by 3.5. He said, no, a million dollars. And realized that I was sitting there not with one of the great scientists of the university, but one of the great scientists of the world. And what we have at Hebrew University is really something going on in science that will change the future for all of us. So it's truly an honor to be here today to pre present our speakers and to begin with Dina Ben Yehuda and the floor is yours. And again, thank you so much for all of you for staying up late and for sharing the great work that you're doing at the university. So we'll, Maggie, can we turn over the floor to Dina in the slides? Uh, good evening, uh, good morning, I don't know where uh, it's uh, late at night here and um, I'm very happy to present to you what we uh, have been doing since the pandemic uh, began. I would start uh, by thanking you for your uh, continued interest, interest and uh, involvement in uh, our university in general and in our faculty of medicine uh, in particular. So uh, I would like to show you some uh, great things that happened with our students during this uh, outbreak. So uh, for me, it was like killing uh, sacred cows. 
you know that most of our students are uh, were born uh, from 1986 and after and they are called the um, the Z gene uh, generation uh, famous for uh, all about technology financial focus uh, no altruism so when uh, it all started uh, we were all very happy and uh, very proud to see that approximately 300 students from our faculty uh, have been trained and started to test uh, for coronavirus from the general population. They worked uh, together with the Israeli Magen David Adom, the national uh, EMS uh, organization. Uh, and the, they uh, went to houses and to uh, also in the drive through uh, testing place in Jerusalem. Uh, they helped to set up and continue to operate the Corona Diagnostic Lab. You will he hear about it from Yuval in a few minutes. And uh, since the schools are closed to, um, are closed and the elderly family members, they were not available for uh, the uh, physicians and nurses, they served as babysitters voluntarily for the medical staff so that uh, the MDs and nurses can continue to treat patients. And they did it all voluntarily. Uh, the students uh, visited uh, kidney transplanted patients at home once a week to take blood in order for them not to come to the hospital. Uh, these patients are in the highest risk uh, of getting infected and for being very sick if they are infected. Students uh, set up drug distribution scheme uh, to elderly patients. They brought the drugs to their doors. Uh, our military truck that uh, Bruce just mentioned um, were part of the uh, mission forces of the IDF. Uh, both in uh, collecting information about the COVID-19 pandemic, but also our computational uh, MD students. You know that we have uh, a new program for students that are studying together medicine and, uh, and also uh, computational science. Uh, they were busy planning the IDF uh, a future long-term uh, combat uh, against the coronavirus. Uh, and they, again, they all did it voluntarily. But uh, I think that uh, the highlight uh, was uh, what Yuval uh, will going to tell you about right now. Okay. Um, Dina, can you move to the next slide? Sure. Oh is coming slowly at me. No, this is the, this is the first slide that you've uh... Yes, all right. So hi, everybody. Good morning, good evening. Um, happy to share with you uh, briefly the adventure that uh, um, was taking place uh, for me in the last uh, two months or so. As Bruce uh, mentioned, I'm, I'm not uh, a virologist. Typically, we study cancer and diabetes and uh, so-called liquid biopsies, we look for biomarkers of diseases. But um, um, so what, what happened, I, I, I will show you a few slides that, that really uh, present uh, what happened. So it actually all started uh, uh, on March 11, late, very late at night, I was called upon to uh, um, um, a meeting at the Ministry of Health Director General Office uh, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And, and we heard there about, there was, it was discussion about how academia can help uh, the health system in, in, in Israel in general. And we, I heard, her, heard her something that really shocked me. They said that uh, a major problem is that the country lacks molecular biologists with expertise that can help with corona tests. That, that's what they thought was, was a major difficulty. And we said, that's, that's not possible. We have hundreds of such, such people in the university, universities that, that can do that. So um, I went home very, very late at night with this in mind. Next slide, Dina. Um, and um, immediately, first thing next morning, I went to uh, uh, Professor Dana Wolf 
She's the, she's a clinician. She's the uh, chief virologist at the Hadassah Hospital, which is next door to our uh, faculty of uh, medicine. And we started immediately a collaboration uh, with a very simple goal in mind. I mean, she had uh, uh, a, a, you know, excellent, but really small scale boutique, as she calls it, uh, operation of uh, a clinical diagnosis of viruses. And, and the goal was clearly to turn this into a, a major operation that can release thousands of tests, corona tests uh, per day. So we knew what we needed. We needed advanced molecular biology equipment. We needed good people. We needed space. We needed authorization to, to, to operate. And, and I'll, I'll show you a bit about that in the next uh, few minutes. So just to remind you all, you probably all know about that from, from media, but uh, the, the process we're talking about is starting with the nasal swab. Uh, this comes to the hospital typically very carefully. You have to inactivate the virus that might exist in, uh, in those swabs. And then there are two key technical steps. You have to extract the, the genetic material from, from that swab and perform this so-called RT-PCR test, the molecular test that will tell you whether there is uh, viral RNA, whether the, there was a virus in that sample taking, uh, taken from that individual. And obviously then you need to decode the sample uh, and, and report the, the result. Uh, next one. Um, so uh, uh, equipment, uh, we figured out that was the easiest part. Turned out that we have uh, uh, essentially all the equipment needed uh, uh, for, for that work. And it was an existing, uh, uh, Dina, can you move to the next slide? Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, advanced equipment that we actually had uh, in our labs, in many labs in the universities, especially in the interdepartmental uh, equipment unit uh, that could be repurposed for, the, for, for uh, performing the corona test. I'm just giving you two uh, examples. On the left is this uh, so-called liquid handling robot, which can uh, uh, process 96 uh, samples in four hours and, and, and uh, generate this uh, RNA. Uh, incidentally and interestingly, I, I don't think that Bruce even knows that, this is the machine that we're using routinely to run the uh, blood samples for our cancer diagnosis uh, um, uh, a project funded by uh, Bruce and, and, and is very kindly and Bruce and his family. So we repurposed that for the purpose of uh, um, isolating uh, viral RNA. On the right is the RT-PCR machine that can uh, perform the molecular analysis. We had many of those in the university. It was, were, were all uh, uh, um, uh, taken for that for the purpose of performing the analysis. Uh, next, Lina. Um, the second, much more important thing is, is, is people, got great people. Uh, these, are, these are the first uh, group of people that joined the team, volunteers initially from uh, people from my lab. Uh, next slide. And then they were joined uh, very quickly by a very large group of people. We got actually essentially hundreds of uh, uh, volunteers uh, uh, that all wanted to uh, uh, contribute to that uh, effort. We selected 50 people that were well-trained. These were spanning really uh, from uh, uh, graduate students, research associates, lab technicians, up to uh, professors at the, at the university, the medical school, and the, uh, and the life sciences campus. These are people standing in front of the interdepartmental unit waiting for their uh, uh, training session. So very quickly, with the help of Dana, of course, we trained the people, they got, became certified uh, for clinical virology work. And very quickly, we started, we divided them into teams of five people that started 24-7 uh, shifts. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, uh, from, from the start, we separated physically the teams that worked at the Hadassah Hospital, the virology lab, and at Hebrew University, because we predicted uh, infections that will shut off one operation. We wanted to keep one uh, intact. But... Uh, uh, fortunately, nobody was infected, so the, the, the masks and the precautions were sufficient. Next slide. Um, uh, uh, one, one point that I can, can just cannot avoid uh, uh, mentioning regards, uh, uh, as we call it, diversity and, 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 and merit. So we have four of the people that uh, participated in the work. So on the left is uh, as Imad, he's a, he's a, uh, he's a Palestinian uh, graduate student from Judith Bergman's lab came along as a volunteer and joined the team. Normina Zazmi is another Palestinian uh, graduate student from Itai's lab. Uh, Judith Magenheim, she's a very experienced research fellow uh, in my laboratory. And on the right is Roni Benami. She's the youngest and the most junior. She's an MD, PhD student, uh, less than 30, I think, that uh, was, she's, she's, she did things in her past. She, she's the founder of a, a well-known Jerusalem refugee clinic and an IDF captain in reserve. And uh, it turned out that she was 
she was appointed by me uh, to be in charge of the entire uh, Corona testing lab with people that were all, all of them much older than her. But this worked really well. Next slide. Um, why don't I see the next slide? Yeah, and, and uh, one, one thing for those of you, just incidental, for those of you who had visited uh, Hadassah, there's this famous rotating door that separates physically the Hadassah Hospital, the Hebrew University, remo removed that barrier for the first time in 60 years, although we, it was uh, uh, forced back by the chief rabbi of the hospital within an hour, but we almost broke the physical barrier. Next slide. Um, and within five days, we were able to obtain our first uh, corona, positive corona test. This is the typical, uh, uh, the typical appearance of that uh, PCR assay. The, the, the lines that shoot up are actually swap samples that uh, turn out positive for corona. Um, we did that within five days. Uh, many universities in Israel tried to do that, but failed. And I think the reason is that they failed to get to authorization because they were not with such close interaction, physical, and, and also experienced collaborations with, with their uh, um, uh, hospitals. So far up to date, we performed 74,000 tests at the Hebrew University Adassa of joint operation, up to 3,000 per day, about six to 7% turned out positive for corona. This amounts to a bit more than 20% of the total tests that were performed uh, uh, in Israel. I wanna spend the last two minutes on, on one key challenge that we were facing from the start, and this was the shortage of, of uh, uh, reagents. Uh, Dina, can I get the, the next slide? So as you know, all countries rushed to perform many, many tests and, and the, the, the plastic wear and, and, and the reagents needed to, to perform the, the test just really uh, were not available. Um, so we, we, we you know, designed a, a, a set of uh, R&D operations starting from very low tech to high tech so the first was an attempt to uh, recycle the, the, the missing plastics. This is way more difficult than people think because these uh, presumably simple plastic tubes are, are super high tech. There are only three factories in the world that uh, manufacture them, but we managed to, to, re to uh, recycle. Way more sophisticated was to device the entire new uh, system for automated preparation of uh, RNA. This was developed by Professor Neil Friedman and Nomi Khabib at uh, the other campus, Life Sciences. Uh, but this involved, uh, and here I'm very proud of the university, this in required purchasing a new robot that uh, cost uh, $150,000. Uh, uh, this was approved by, in 10 minutes by the Hebrew University VP of Research, and within one day we obtained the robot from a, a Hebrew, a, a, an Israeli startup uh, a company that was willing to um, donate that. And, and the last thing that is uh, interesting, we adopted a method of pooling samples. That is, instead of uh, uh, sampling all all uh, swabs one at a time, what we um, figured out that we could test, uh, uh, we could pull eight samples together, uh, as you see on the bottom here, and instead of testing them one by one, you can test just the mix. And if it's negative, you release the entire set of eight people as negatives. If one of the sets is, pos is positive, as, the, as you see in the fourth row from, from the top, you open this up and you run individually the eight tests and find the the one that's positive. So with this method, you can essentially multiply the number of tests that you can for, for, perform, perform by eightfold, which is dramatic. And this is a major um, outcome of that uh, uh, study. And one more, Dina, I think the last one, yes. Um, so overall, I mean, the last thing I want to say is that uh, this uh, brought us into very extensive uh, 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 discussion exchanges with national, international teams, mostly people trying to learn from us how to, uh, uh, how to do that, how to uh, adapt the university setup for, for Corona tests. This was Tel Aviv University, the, the, the IDF, the Army Lab, uh, a team at Barcelona, uh, people from Blue Shield, California, Buenos Aires, Maimonides Geratic Center in, in Montreal that is right now trying to handle an outbreak there. So that was uh, interesting and exciting. Uh, one general lesson, things that we knew from before, but now we appreciate much more is how what, 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 uh, how strong is the, is, is the interaction or collaboration between, uh, what, the, what is the potential of the interaction between Hebrew University and the adjacent uh, hospital? This, this gives us really tremendous power. And, and right now we're continuing uh, extensive research looking to the future, for example, developing better tests, uh, identifying new drugs, testing them, and, 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 and uh, deeper efforts to understand the pathology of the disease. And I think on that, uh, uh, Moran will elaborate. Yuval, if yes. I can, 
as Yuval was speaking, this is Itai Ben Parath, and uh, I, Yuval emphasized how unique this uh, uh, immediate collaboration between the clinic and the Hebrew University as an academic institution was in Israel. But I couldn't help thinking, and I'm going to take over the screen for one second to share uh, today's New York Times, uh, and I hope everybody can see this. This is in the New York Times today talking about the tremendous difficulty in the US where immediately academic uh, labs that have very strong expertise and could run tests tried to do this, but actually could not because of a whole bunch of barriers that you can get into. And you know, this is from today and I recommend reading this to appreciate what was done at the Hebrew University. And this is why really uh, the effort that Yuval very quickly now just described bringing together the clinical testing with the, our academic uh, molecular abilities is really unique uh, worldwide. And uh, in America, it's been an extreme difficulty to execute uh, the, the same type of effort. Back to you, Dina, I'm sorry. All right, so I think um, I can take it from here. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Miran Yasur and I'm a computational biologist. So namely, I'm a computer scientist and I study biology and, and medical um, fields. And, and the reason I got into the picture is I came to Yuval's office and wanted to consult with him about a project that I'll tell you at the end. But then I got kind of pulled into this pooling concept, which I thought was fascinating. And again, the idea is, uh, is to just to recap on what Yuval said is that instead of testing each sample individually, we can really test eight samples together. And if the result is negative, that's easy. Everything is negative. But if the result is positive, we can then individually check each one of these eight samples and find out the positive one. Um, and again, the concept is, is very elegant and very nice, and there are a few limitations to it that, that we need to bear in mind. One is that we need to think about what is the fraction of positive tests that we expect, because we don't want to have, you know, added tests just on the top of everything, right? So we don't want to test all pools and then find many pools that are positive, then because at the end we'll make, we'll have to test more samples than we wanted initially. And second, we need to think about the assay itself. We need to think about whether we have enough sensitivity to really pool so many samples together and still maintain good accuracy of the result. And so the idea is that if this works, as you've all mentioned, it saves us a lot of reagents, which are of course a very strong bottleneck as all of you have heard, um, also saves us a lot of money. But I think what's very important at this point um, is that it saves us a lot of time because we can, we can test a lot more samples at the same time um, as we have tested before, but, but significantly better. And so the big question remained at some point, which was um, which types of samples can we run using this approach? And until now, what was done is that A, this pooling um, strategy was only used at the Hebrew University Hadassah Joint Lab, and it was only uh, performed on asymptomatic subjects. So for example, when you test a lot of clinicians or when you test a lot of um, people from the police force, for example, and you want to make sure that all of them are in good shape and can continue doing their work. Now, at this point, as you've all mentioned, we have about 74,000 tests that have been done in this joint lab. And maybe we can use computer science and big data approaches to try and learn from all these 74, nearly 75,000 tests. So the, the concept is, let's think of it kind of like a big data set of biological data. We have, for each sample, we know the gender of the person who was tested, the age of that person. We also know their neighborhood, and even we can tell some of their symptoms. And now the question is, can we build a better model that given all these features will predict the chance of each of these subjects to be positive? And based on this prediction, we can answer the big question, which is here, whether to pool or not to pool. That is the question that we're looking at. And the idea is that if we can really choose which samples are ideal for a pooling system, we can advance the number, increase the number of samples that we can pool at each time point, and even increase further our uh, throughput every day. And so this is what we're currently uh, doing, where we, we have students that are machine learning experts and they take all this information into account. And we're trying to see, again, this is a very tricky balance between the, the 
fraction of positive tests within each data set, right? And we can, we can also know like what's the source of the samples that we were given and to predict whether or not this would be a good candidate for pooling, yes or no. And based on the actual result, because we don't just get a positive or negative, we really get a quantitative result. We can simulate what would have happened if we had pooled this and come back together um, later on and say, okay, we have a better system. And the reason that we're looking for better systems um, is that we are, worried that this you know coronavirus virus is not really gone we're we're looking ahead to what potentially could be the next wave and we want to reach that next wave if it happens better prepared than definitely than we have reached the first but even better prepared than what we are at this point in time so these are the kinds of efforts that we're doing now um, if we have a few more minutes, I just want to tell you about a little another project because I um, Maggie told me before that maybe some of you are, have heard me talk about diapers and microbiome and, and newborns in general. Um, and I think that we, we I just want to say that we're all continuing our research from before to some degree, and we're trying to see what's the impact of coronavirus specifically on, on our topics. So specifically for my research lab, we were really fascinating and we were approached by um, OBGYN clinicians saying, look, we have like, you know, in Jerusalem, we have very strong um, ultra orthodox community. They have very high birth um, rates. And what happens is that a lot of them had coronavirus positive. And so we saw that we had um, a lot of sick women who come to deliver and yet their babies are, un um, we don't find any coronavirus detected in them. And so that started to make us think about what's going on and what's the potential route of transmission and, and is it there and we just can't find it and what, you know, we can think about it more and more. And basically the idea is, and now we're starting to set up this, um, this new cohort is we're trying, because we're focused on maternal to child uh, microbial transfer, we're now turning this into coronavirus transfer from mother to child. And we're collecting samples from whatever we can think of from both the mother and the child. Um, these include um, maternal blood and placenta and amniotic fluid and cord blood and we're trying to track down the locations of which of these body niches actually had positive presence of the coronavirus and whether those are potential transmission patterns. Now to take this one step further we're gonna we're gonna further sequence what we have in the genome of these viruses and the reason to do that is we want to try and correlate the specific variants of the virus to potential pregnancy outcome, adverse pregnancy outcome. And the idea is that we want to um, really characterize variants that could be of, of risk pregnancies and we want to identify them as early as possible and monitor them accordingly as at-risk pregnancies. Um, so these are kind of the things that we're doing in concept of how do we use big data and um, computer modeling or mathematical modeling into the studying of coronavirus at the Hebrew University. I turn it back to Dina. Um, so I would like to share with you again. Do you see my slides? So uh, one of the wonderful things that happened in the faculty is that uh, each and every scientist in uh, in our faculty uh, took them their uh, expertise and their uh, um, knowledge uh, to try and to use the methods that they are using in their own research uh, to fight corona. So I'll give you a few examples just uh, and I chose examples that uh, uh, the research is very unique to the Hebrew University uh, and not uh, exactly what's going on everywhere in the world. So uh, uh, from the beginning, everybody spoke about uh, uh, antibodies, which are the uh, products of uh, B lymphocytes. Uh, but in uh, our faculty, three researchers, three PIs, uh, chose to look at other three cells that are involved in uh, fighting uh, infections, the natural killer cells, the T cells, and the neutrophils. And uh, uh, one of the important things to, to say is that uh, we know that uh, the most uh, problematic clinical picture was uh, that is uh, being done by the virus is the inflammation process in the lungs. 
Uh, usually this is the uh, reason for the morbidity and also for the mortality from this virus. So it's a very important research, three researchers that uh, three researchers that uh, are ongoing and have uh, preliminary, very important results. Um, we have a, a very talented virologist in our uh, uh, faculty, um, Dr. Alex Rubinsky, together with a lot many other microbiologists. Uh, they actually looked at uh, the whole uh, a story of uh, antibodies and vaccination in a different uh, way. Uh, everybody is looking for uh, antibodies, but they are not looking only for antibo specific antibody, but for the whole virus uh, antigens, all virus uh, proteins uh, that needs to be attacked, and they can differentiate between antibodies that uh, won't do anything uh, with the interaction of the virus with the lung cells and they are not important at all uh, versus uh, antibodies that uh, uh, will attack the, uh, the epithelial cells and uh, these are the most important one. Uh, another group of uh, scientists uh, took the uh, RNA of the virus, the um, the, and attacked the RNA by using like uh, decoy viruses, uh, fake viruses, and they uh, package the RNA into a, a nanoparticles. And the, in this way, they stop the uh, ability of the virus to infect uh, tissues. Uh, last but not least, and this is one of our uh, major ongoing uh, uh, effort. Uh, we are, we, as, as you well know, uh, in order to understand, uh, both to understand the virus and its mechanism of action, uh, and to, to try and find uh, how to uh, to, to attack the virus uh, using vaccination or uh, all kind of other treatment, um, we need the, both laboratories that are uh, highly uh, secured and uh, where people can work without uh, being infected. Uh, we call it the BCL3 laboratory but also we need to have an animal model. Uh, you know that mice are not uh, getting infected by the virus. They don't have uh, the receptor that the virus needs to, to infect the tissue. So we are now uh, creating special mice that uh, will be able to have to be a model for uh, investigating the disease. And um, we purchased uh, and we hope to get by uh, October uh, two movable uh, laboratories from the state and I uh, would like to take this uh, opportunity uh, to thank uh, the Schwartz family, uh, Shirley and Brad for their uh, very very generous uh, uh, donation. Without it we couldn't uh, even start thinking about uh, is such a, an important purchase that uh, we are doing right now. And uh, last but not least, uh, we, our main uh, uh, line of uh, research in the faculty now and uh, uh, our main goal is to develop a, a, a a medicine that is computational and uh, a personalized medicine to our patients. And uh, the coronavirus is a very good model to study it. Uh, you know that uh, uh, there are a population that are more susceptible and population that are less susceptible. Uh, we know about the uh, comorbidities, but uh, we also know that men are uh, more susceptible to the disease than women. 
Uh, there is a, a, a story about the blood type of a patient that can cause the disease to be even worse. And uh, we have a group of researchers uh, in our um, a faculty that are concentrating now on the genetic background of the patients, understanding why some patients will have a very serious disease even when they are young and have no uh, comorbidities and some very old patients with a lot of comorbidities uh, will survive the disease and uh, will not even be infected. And uh, as uh, Moran said, the uh, computational biology and computational medicine is the key for a uh, personalized medicine. And uh, we are now in the process of uh, 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 using a very huge project in this uh, direction. And you can see here, this is a simulation of the building that we are building in the, in the campus for computational uh, medicine center. Um, we have already uh, got uh, some of the money from donations and we are still uh, uh, recruiting uh, more donation to complete it. Uh, and I just want to say that uh, uh, for me as a physician uh, who I'm, I'm a hematologist uh, treating patients with uh, uh, malignant uh, hematological uh, diseases. Um, my patients are the more susceptible patients for uh, the coronavirus and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of patients that we had to treat uh, uh, while uh, the pandemic was still very active uh, with chemotherapy and uh, and I saw the uh, disease from uh, both sides. And um, I have to tell you that I'm very worried. I'm not worried about the second uh, wave that everybody is talking about. I'm uh, worried that uh, uh, we, the community, the global community will make the same mistake that uh, was done in uh, to that 2004, because uh, you know that the uh, SARS uh, coronavirus one and the COVID-19, which is actually SARS coronavirus two, uh, cause the same uh, disease in human. Uh, you can't differentiate. And uh, I know that uh, in 2004, uh, when the pandemic uh, subsided, all the research uh, stopped. Uh, and uh, part of the reason for uh, research to continue or to stop is the support that uh, it gets because uh, research is, uh, as you well know, very expensive. So uh, my, my uh, fear is that uh, we'll do the same mistake because if in 2004 people would have uh, uh, go, go on uh, researching the SARS-CoV coronavirus one, I think that our condition would have been better uh, today. And uh, the way that we are fighting the disease uh, now uh, using uh, isolation uh, methods uh, uh, is very important, but uh, uh, in Israel we have now 1 million and 200 uh, thousand uh, unemployed people and uh, for us uh, this uh, disaster in the uh, economy is a uh, is a very serious uh, condition and i think that uh, uh, it uh, harms the health of uh, many many patients uh, and so i hope that uh, people will understand that we have to be prepared for a SARS co coronavirus 3 or, or another virus that can attack us and we have to go on and study the, this uh, a topic uh, in depth in all uh, uh, 
disciplines, not only medicine, uh, in order to be prepared better uh, next time, because uh, it seems that uh, eventually there will be a next time. So uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, we are all uh, ready to hear your questions. Please feel free to chat. You can type a question in the chat box at the bottom, or you can raise your hand to indicate that you would like to ask a question. Well, Maggie, if I could just um, begin to break the ice here. Um, Dina, how important is this BSL-3 lab? Because if we think about viruses going back to, to polio, and interestingly, Jonas Salk was a Jewish scientist who lived in the same town near my grandmother. And some of the people who worked in his lab taught us in medical school and still said the importance of studying virology, which we may not have thought was as important as maybe looking at HIV at the time or the advances in leukemia, but it really seems like, as you said, that to really protect everybody from the future, that, lab, that labs like this are going to be very important. But is, can you give us a sense for how, how important and how urgent the, the need is for this lab? So, uh, so I'll tell you, you, you know, we have only one uh, BCL3 lab in Israel, which is in Estiona, and it's under the... Um, supervision of the Ministry of uh, Security. And uh, the scientists in this laboratory, in this uh, institute, uh, were uh, uh, queuing. They have to wait for a place in their laboratory. And uh, for weeks now, uh, actually nobody works with the real virus. And uh, we had a very small uh, BSL-3 laboratory in the campus, but uh, as a dean, I felt that uh, the most important thing to, uh, to check if, if it's uh, really safe to work there. And it was uh, amazing to see how much it wasn't safe to work there. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I didn't give, give permission to anybody to, to go into this uh, laboratory with live uh, viruses. So I think that uh, having the BSL-3 and the ABSL-3 uh, um, soon, I hope, uh, is the only way to, to do research with live viruses. Without it, uh, it's all uh, like using a mock or a uh, decoy. We, we are not using the real virus. So I, I can't even uh, start uh, explaining how much it is important. And to say again, thank you to the Schwartz family because this uh, money was the way to convince the university to go on with it because uh, we had to have something. And uh, I just want to tell you that the uh, a Ministry of uh, Security uh, decided to, to uh, that this laboratory will be the national laboratory uh, for uh, uh, the BSL, this B BSL three and ABSL three. And um, uh, today I was told that uh, we we asked for budget from them as well, and today we were informed that the budget uh, was approved and we hope that we will get it uh, uh, by next week. But it's ben, still not enough. I know you've raised your hand, go ahead. Yes, question for Dr. Yasur. I'm still trying to understand how exactly you pull your samples and identify the positives and the negatives. How do you sort them out? So, Thank you for the question. It's a very, it's, think of it as a simple experiment. Think that I'm giving you eight vials, okay? And I have already like made all the viruses inactive in those. So you can handle them in a relatively safe lab, right? Not the BSL-3 top-notch lab. You mix them all together into a single tube, 
okay? And then you run the regular test on the single tube. The regular test, what it actually does is it searches for specific viral um, RNA, specific genes that are found inside this coronavirus. Now, if we don't find any viral DNA or viral RNA in those mixed samples, that means that none of them had them, right? If our, if our test was sensitive enough, and that's why we chose eight and not 80 for that matter. So if we know that everything was negative, that means all samples were negative. Now, if we know that there was a positive test for the pool, now we know that there was at least one sample that we was positive, but we can still tell apart which one it was. Then we're moving into a second step in which we individually test all these eight samples that were in the pool, and then we know which one was positive. Now, the nice trick about it is that, I mean, we saved a lot of money and time and effort, right, on doing it pooled, but because we only pooled eight, if we find a pool that was positive, we only need to do eight additional, right? If we had 80, we then needed to do like 80 additional um, individual tests. So that's the main idea. Great, thank you. Now I get it. I have a second question for uh, Dr. Ben Yehuda. Can you elaborate on the NK studies and the T lymphocyte and the neutrophils? I wasn't sure exactly what the experiments looked like. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> uh, the immune system in the case of the coronavirus uh, has double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, in one hand, uh, probably uh, some of the immune system is recruited to fight the virus, but we know that uh, in the way some of the cells are causing a lot of harm. Uh, for example, the uh, T cells uh, cause secretion of uh, biological materials that are causing the inflammation in the lungs. And, uh, and the, the idea is to find out which uh, part of the immune system is important to fight the viruses. Um, is it really the antibodies? And if it's the antibodies, which antibodies are good antibodies and which antibodies are not effective? And uh, the same for the cells that are fighting uh, infections like the granulocytes, the T cells, and the natural killing ce killer cells. So uh, that's what they're doing now. And so maybe, do you have any data as to which is doing what? Um, not yet, though there was a, a published, uh, um, I think the two days ago, uh, not by our scientists, that the T cells are playing a, a major role in, the, uh, in fighting the virus. Uh, maybe even more than the uh, antibodies. Thank you. Uh, Yuval, uh, Itai, you want to add something? Um... No, I agree. No. The, T the T cells are critical in the, in the response. Yeah, so, very, very interesting. Thank you. Bill Kilberg, I think you had a question. Yes. Uh, how, how is Hebrew University's collaborative approach different from what other universities and laboratories have been doing? Maybe you will answer. Well, I think, uh, I think bringing the clinical practice and academic research together, uh, really the crisis emphasized how not straightforward it is. Uh, and Again, as Yuval described earlier, uh, during, the, during the crisis, other academic institutions in Israel wanted to play a part in the clinical testing. For example, Weizmann Institute from the very beginning was kind of clamoring, we can do thousands and thousands of, t of tests. But in fact, it was extremely difficult uh, to get their uh, capabilities into clinical practice uh, the, through because of these various barriers. One simple thing is having an authorized diagnostic clinician be able to sign off on the tests and having all of the methods properly validated. 
um, so that they match clinical standards. And uh, this is a thing that's, that's very, um, a very broad, large scale problem in the US as I mentioned earlier. And I think, uh, and, and the faculty, and Yuval can add to that, first of all, there was a bottom-up initiative coming directly from the scientists and the students on the ground with the actual uh, practitioners, uh, Donna Wolf, the head of diagnostics. So as, as, since the chief of diagnostics was already right there when this initiative took place, actually this, this uh, collapsed the initial barrier and then things started operating and went kind of bottom up and there weren't any, and, I'm, and from the top, there weren't any imposed hurdles to prevent this. So this whole process was very unique. It's a, it's a consequence of uh, being kind of uh, nimble and quick and trying to avoid um, potential regulatory and logistical obstacles and I think this is very, very different from what happened uh, in, other, in other institutions that ran into these types of difficulties. Of course, you can add. If I can add uh, one more thing, uh, just to, to give you an example why I think that uh, we are unique. Uh, Everybody is uh, very interested in uh, plasma and serum of uh, uh, patients that are uh, healthy from, uh, that recovered from uh, corona. And uh, uh, we have uh, scientists working on, uh, on this uh, plasma in, uh, in their laboratory. But uh, it's just uh, the physicians that treated these patients and went to the uh, hotels where they uh, uh, stayed after they uh, were uh, discharged from the hospital that are bringing this plasma to our scientists. And the scientists are helping my blood bank uh, to find the best plasma to give to our patients. And that's something that you don't see anywhere. I think that this, uh, the fact that we, we work together and I, I have to say that uh, it all started from Yuval. You know, uh, he won't remember, but uh, like uh, one uh, night, very late at night, he told me, now I understand that uh, maybe I should have been a physician. Because all of a sudden, he was uh, really treating patients. And I don't think that scientists uh, anywhere else uh, in the world uh, could have this uh, feeling. And taking a... Uh, talented scientists like uh, the three that are, are here, Yuval and, uh, and Itai and Moran, and uh, giving them the feeling that they are doing the research not to have another paper in science, but to have a better treatment for patients that are two meters away from them, okay, because they are in the hospital, I think that this is a compassion that you can't get anywhere. And you know how I felt it? I felt it because I, 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 felt, I, I knew it because I felt that they are not interested anymore in uh, achieving something for a grant or for a papers. They're really doing things uh, to improve diagnosis to improve a uh, treatment and uh, for me as physician it was like uh, you know that's what I want uh, that's I want medicine to look like that I have an unmet, unmet need and the best uh, brains in the world are uh, fighting with me against this unmet need so I think that if I have to say one a uniqueness about uh, our faculty. Um, this is the uniqueness, and more than that, I think that Yuval will tell you that uh, we were we were approached by people from the Broad Institute because they understood that the first day that we got the first sample, we started to build a bank of the, of uh, 
samples for DNA for, from the patients and for RNA from the viruses. And this is like a treasure. So sorry that I, I answered so long for a short question, but the, this is really the essence of everything. This is the best question. Thank you, Dina. Wendy, you had a question. Uh, two part. Um, as far as the BSL-3 laboratory, how far away are, we, are you not finished with the one laboratory or are you wanting to build another laboratory? I was, I'm not clear on that. So I'll explain. We, we took the old laboratory and we did like a, an urgent treatment. It's a very small one. Right. And uh, I, I hope that by next week, but when I'm saying next week, it means that we are now uh, more than two months late, uh, that we'll have something that will be just uh, till we get the real laboratories. We don't have animal uh, lab right now for coronavirus uh, animal model, but we'll have a very small laboratory where people will be able to use uh, cell cultures and viruses for a very urgent experiment. Uh, the laboratories that we ordered um, are uh, mobile laboratories when they come in, uh, we have uh, like the uh, backbone of the, of, the, uh, of the lab, but uh, we still need to purchase everything inside the lab. Uh, and this is very expensive. So uh, uh, I think that uh, what we're, we're trying to do now is to be ready for these laboratories to come with all the equipment that we need, with all the manpower that we need. And uh, because uh, we've already have uh, everything ready for, for it to have to, to, start, to start working there. Including, by the way, just for uh, the curios of it, we have uh, a, a strong collaboration with uh, a very brilliant uh, Chinese scientists that uh, uh, are willing to share with us uh, the con contra construct that uh, we'll be able to, to have very, very fast the uh, animal uh, model using their contra uh, construct. So we are collaborating with uh, China as well uh, around. Thank you. Rob, you had a question. Oh. You're on mute. Let's unmute you. Hmm. There we go. There we go. Hi, thank you very much for this nice um, uh, seminar. And we, you know, I have a questions related to um, whether the COVID-19 virus might uh, stay in infected patient's body after patient recover from the infection. That's question number one. Uh, and basically whether those, this virus will acting like HIV or hepatitis B virus, because they basically stay in patient's body beyond recovery. Um, and the second question is related to whether um, the um, antibody that generated from the patient who recover, uh, how long those uh, natural antibody will last. I'm not sure we have a, answers to all those questions, but I wanted to ask if anyone knows. Uh, Dina, maybe you are the right person to answer, no? Yeah, I, 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 I wanted to be I'm a clinician. talking too no. much. <laughs> Uh, so um, the the answer about your first question, uh, we don't really know yet, because uh, we have now the measures. One of them was developed in our faculty to 
to have the uh, quantitative uh, measurement of uh, the amount of antibodies. But uh, as I told you before, uh, we are not sure that these antibodies are efficient. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we had uh, very severe patients in our intensive care unit, uh, we decided, you know, like last measurement to save lives, to start giving plasma from uh, patients who recovered from uh, the disease. Yes. And uh, and what we did, we checked, we double checked that the, uh, the, the, they have no active viruses in the blood, uh, the, the, reco the patients who recovered from uh, uh, the coronavirus. And we gave the plasma uh, as plasma uh, to, to these patients. And uh, in some cases, it, it worked uh, uh, very nicely. In some patients, it didn't help at all. And uh, this uh, raised, the, the, raised the, though the amount of the antibodies that we measured were the same. So uh, probably it's not the quanti quantity, but the quality of the antibodies probably some of the antibodies are not uh, neutralizing the virus, whereas some, even in a small amount, uh, might uh, deactivate uh, the virus. And uh, the idea is that from, uh, uh, from every 13 donors, uh, we are giving now the plasma to a special uh, uh, industry uh, where they are taking the antibodies out and will be able to give concentrated antibodies. But here again, it might be that in uh, some of the battles that we'll give our patients, uh, the antibodies will be very effective and some not. Mm. But I believe that uh, the group that is working in our faculty remember the name uh, Alex Rubinsky, a very talented young uh, virologist. Uh, I hope that uh, he'll be able to, to make the difference, be to, to find the difference between uh, good antibodies and bad antibodies. But uh, as, uh, as uh, 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 I was asked before by Benno, I think, uh, about the T cells, maybe after we'll have all these uh, precious antibodies, we'll understand that the most important uh, fighters are the T cells and not the antibodies. So still so much to learn, so much to understand, so much to investigate. And that's why I'm, I, I emphasize that if we we'll stop investigating, because uh, everything will go back to normal, uh, it will be a big, big mistake. And do we know how long the antibody will last from those who generated antibody from, you know, recovery? So we are just starting to learn it. We are taking, uh, we know that uh, there is no use to take plasma for patient less than two weeks after they recovered, after the symptoms subsided and they feel well, uh, because uh, then they, there, there are no antibodies at all. We know that usually antibodies are surviving in the blood like six weeks. So what is the window of the, 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 the best time to take the antibodies? We're still studying it. We don't know the answer yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And about the virus load that um, from the patient who recover, the virus load almost like none. What was the method to measure the virus load? Oh, I can, I can ask that. No more virus. Um, and then we, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I can answer. I mean, when, as, as the disease progresses, when people recover, uh, the virus literally disappears, goes to zero from the nose and throat. Uh, it's never found in the blood. 
uh, it's never found in even in stool in terms of no no infectious uh, particles were found in stool. So as far as we know right now, once you recover, virus is gone. It will be, but nobody really looked at potentially you know hidden places like uh, in the intestinal epithelial cells or something like that. So that will be a big surprise and a major major finding. But as far as we know today, um, there's a peak of the virus. Uh, then it disappears from the nose, it goes to the lungs, and then it's either, if you, if you, if on, in those that survive, it's, uh, it seems to be cleared completely. Thank you. That's good Thank to you. know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bruce, can I turn it back to you? Sure, we're getting near the end of the hour. Dina, Yaval, Moran, Itai, we really can't thank you enough for your presentation and really sharing with us the, the groundbreaking work that's going on in the university. Dr. William Kalin, who received the Nobel Prize in Medicine this past year, I had the honor of working with as a resident, Johns Hopkins, almost 40 years ago. And he wrote an op-ed in the New York Times stating that it is so very important to invest in basic research and science because we may not know where it's going, but it may often lead to places that we do not know. And I can tell you the two unique things, what's different at Hebrew University are the researchers, the people themselves, and how hard they work. When you walk through a lab there, you walk by the electron microscope and you see lab time written down at two and three and four o'clock in the morning because they share the equipment. And as you've all showed a piece of equipment that our family was able to help provide as part of cancer research in no way whatsoever did we know that years later there'd be a pandemic and help to run samples eight or 24 at a time. There's no way to predict that. But the importance of investment is important. And the other thing that I wanted to say, there's a big difference when you invest in Hebrew University and in Israel, and it's this. If you talk to our friends in the United States and we invest in scientists there, you're paying for their healthcare insurance, you're paying for their malpractice insurance, you are paying for the university dean's fee, and pretty soon you donate a dollar, there's about 20 cents left on that dollar for the researchers to have, and they can't even hire a lab assistant. Money that's donated is an investment in research at Hebrew University and in our researchers that truly believe will make a better world in science and a better world for our children and grandchildren, really people everywhere. So a big group hug to all, all of you as researchers from all of us and just wanted to say thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good afternoon and good morning. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. It was great. Thanks. Bye-bye.